This is my first lecture that I'm giving online to nobody. So you're gonna excuse me if I'm a little uncomfortable. We're gonna be talking about the anatomy and physiology, particularly the functional anatomy and physiology of the stomatognathic system. So, as I give this discussion, I'm gonna cover many different subjects. We're gonna start with the idea of just the skull anatomy, the infratemporal fossa, the temporal fossa. We'll talk about the muscles of mastication. I'm gonna get into a little bit into the nerves and blood vessels of the head, but that's more of another talk. We're gonna talk about the tergopalatine fascia but we're especially gonna talk about fascia connections, muscle function, postural implications, nerve entrapments. Not the science of anatomy, which you can read, but rather how this affects us as doctors and our patients. So I'm gonna put this into the different format. And if you have any questions at any point, please stop with me. So we're gonna start off with the temporal fossa. Um, in general, we're talking about the science of cranial facial pain and oral facial pain and TMD. And each of these parts are very important. I've got a whole lot of different things I've done. I've been around for 40 years. If you add them all up, that plus three bucks will buy you a cup of coffee at Starbucks but I did borrow some information from other places. So I'm gonna kind of go over that. There's a book, it's one of my favorites, it's called The Face by Redlansky. And I specifically pulled a few images from it for this lecture, but the images actually turn out much better when you look at them in the book. They do not have a digital version of them. I use this book all the time to talk with patients. It's an amazing book. So I called the publisher and they agreed that if you were interested, there's a site you can use, a code here you can use, and you can get 20% off the book site. It's an amazing book giving you layer by layer dissections that are, feel like they're in real time as you go through them. Another book that I highly recommend that are some of the pictures in, are from in this book and the is Janet Travell's Myofascial Pain and Dysfunction. It actually has a volume one and a volume two, and both volumes are important. Even though we're dentists, you need the lower half of the body, and I'm gonna explain why. This is the second edition. The first edition is good, the second edition is better, but I'm gonna suggest you avoid the third edition. If you already own a copy of the third edition, you may wanna pass it on to a physical therapist or a massage therapist, but buy yourself an issue of the second edition. It's much more helpful for dentists. This is an article about the neuromuscular dentistry and the autonomic nervous system. I'm gonna do that in another talk, but I will make some references to the spinopalatine ganglion, the other parasympathetic ganglions of the head that are connected to the trigeminal nerve, but it'll actually be covered in more detail in another article. So let's start off with the skull. When we talk about the skull, we need to remember that we're talking about hard bones. In humans, the skull is not fixed like it is when we study dry skulls. So looking from the lateral side, we have the parietal bone, we have the temporal bone, but the important thing right here is the intertemporal fossa. Some of these lines are in the wrong spot here, if you notice. Uh, this is where the trigeminal nerve lies. When I talk about the spinopalatine ganglion blocks, very often we'll do what's called a suprazygomatic approach, which means we come in from above the zygomatic arch. Um, and that allows us Okay, hang on. We come in from here and go down to the tergopalatine fissure that I'll show you. That allows us direct access to the spinopalatine ganglion, which again, we'll talk about more. 
This is a picture coming out of the book, The Face, and it's just the skull, but layer upon layer, we get to dissect and watch, and it's in great detail, so I highly recommend it. One of the problems we have, though, is everything we look at, we like to look at it from one dimension, and everything in the body is three-dimensional. We can look at it front to back or back to front, right to left or left to right, from the top down or the bottom up. We've never really thought that way of dentists, but because of cone beam x-rays, more and more and more, we're learning to examine things in all three different dimensions. It's exciting and it's confusing. So let's go back to two-dimensional. The infratemporal fossa, up, up above, we have the temporal bone, that's the temporal bone of the temporal mandibular joint. We have the condyle. That's the condyle of the mandible of the temporal mandibular joint. A little bit below that, you can see the styloid process. We have the teeth and the jaw joints. Obviously, we have two jaw joints. Up in this area, we have the greater wing of the sphenoid. We'll talk more about the sphenoid as well. This is the coronoid notch. The coronoid notch is what makes neuromuscular dentistry possible. If that whole area was filled with bone, we wouldn't be able to pulse the maxillary division of the, tri of the trigeminal nerve. When we come up from the bottom of the skull and we look at the infratemporal fossa, we get to see the hard palate. Over here and over here are the greater palatine foramens. We can do an injection, sometimes we do a palatal, but we can actually go up into the canal and we can do a full maxillary block through there. Now, when we do that, we not only block the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve, but we also block the sphenopalatine ganglion, which is the largest parasympathetic ganglion of the, of the head, but it also carries sympathetic fibers. Over here, we have the medial pterygoid plate. The medial pterygoid plate is where the medial pterygoid muscle attaches. It's important that you see where this attachment is, though, to understand that the medial pterygoid muscle is the primary flexor of the mandible. It literally will bend the, maxil, maxil, the, excuse me, the mandible together, bringing the condyles closer together. This is kind of forgotten nowadays, but back in the 70s and 80s, when we were doing subperiosteal implants, we learned that the flexion of the mandible was a major problem. And we had to redesign the implants so they would flex with the mandible. Over here, we have the lateral pter pterygoid plate. That's where the lateral pterygoid muscle connects that goes to the neck of the condyle and to the disc. And again, here's the greater wing of the sphenoid. There's one on each side, and as these muscles connect to the sphenoid, they tend to flex the sphenoid. Also important, which we'll talk about a little farther down. So the sphenoid bone, as it flexes, tends to act like a pump. It actually allows the other jaws, other muscles, excuse me, it allows the other muscles of the skull to move around because all of us learned about TMJ disorders and anatomy studying dried hard skulls, we sometimes think things don't move. We now know different from cranial practitioners and cranial sacral practitioners that the bones are supposed to move and it, that movement helps with cerebral spinal fluid. Swallowing and the function of the sphenoid bones is probably one of the primary motors of movement of, of, the, of the cranial fluids. So moving downward, we come to the lingual side of the mandible. We have the mandibular foramen where the mandibular nerve goes in. We have the neck of the condyle, the mandibular notch. But if you move to the picture on the right, we also have a lot of fascia attachments. We have the Tergomandibular raphe, we've got the stylomandibular ligament, the sphenomandibular ligament. We don't always think about it, 
but our jaw is suspended like a swing from fascial attachments, from the joint capsule to the various ligaments. And this is important because it's important for how things function. If we forget about it, then we don't really understand all of the function. The mandible doesn't float freely in space just for muscles. It floats, but it floats while it's on a swing. It's suspended by fascia. Again, we always want to talk about masticatory muscles. The problem with talking about masticatory muscles is where does one muscle start and the other muscle begin? And it's a huge problem because we learned about anatomy, one muscle at a time. We learned about dissections or pictures of one muscle at a time. But anybody who's ever taken a whole raw chicken and decided to cut it up or divide it, you can't really tell one muscle from another. That chicken is more, that raw chicken is more like a bag of bones. There's skin, there's fascia, there's muscle, there's fat, but it's basically a bag of soft tissue holding the bones. The tergomandibular raffae connects the medial pterygoid to the mandible. Uh, medial pterygoid plate to the mandible. It's important here because these are where the, the jaw muscles, the cheek muscles connect and the pharyngeal muscles connect. There's not a single layer, and I'm gonna keep going through this, that medial pterygoid plate is very important for lots of reasons. Looking from underneath the jaw again, uh, we can see the foramen ovale over here. That's where the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve comes out. Over here, we have the tergomaxillary fissure. That's the entrance into the tergopalatine fossa. So when the trigeminal nerve, the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve leaves the brain, leaves the hard part of the calvarium, it enters into the, the little pyramid-shaped tergopalatine fossa. Along with it, we also have the maxillary, the, the maxillary artery and we have the sphenopalatine ganglion, which is the largest parasympathetic ganglion of the head. It's all in this very small area, which is very important to us. We can see going lower down the sphenomandibular ligaments. We've got the styloid process and the stylomandibular ligaments. All of these are important because they form that swing or that sling for the mandible that operates independently of the muscle. The, the jaw just hangs from it. So even if we have total and complete muscle relaxation, it will swing along these fascial uh, ropes. Again, when we look at our joints, we always have these pictures and most of us are used to looking at pictures of joints cut in sections. So we have the articular eminence or the articular tubercle. We've got the mandibular fossa, and we have the disc. We have a space above the disc and below the disc, and we have the condyle. Around the whole thing, we have a joint capsule. So this is how we think about it. But in reality, when we see histology pictures, we see pictures like this. And this picture is a lie because it shows us the condyle and it shows us the disc, and it shows us the articular eminence in the fossa, and it shows us all these spaces. The spaces are all artifact. In life, when we're living, we're alive, we're not dehydrated, everything is always in close packed condition. So this would be the disc, here's the condyle, this is the articular eminence, and this is not a space, but this is the, whoops, excuse me, that is the retrodiscal lamina. The retrodiscal lamina is filled with blood vessels and nerves, but it's a very lightly packed tissue full of spaces, blood vessels and nerves that's never ever supposed to be pressed on. The pressure of the joint is between the condyle and the articular eminence through the disc. Excuse me. So the temporomandibular joint has two different movements. 
So I'm gonna kind of try to demonstrate. One movement is a ball and socket movement. The ball and socket movement happens in the lower compartment. It always works. If our jaw gets locked or stuck, doesn't really matter. That ball and socket just rotates. The upper compartment is different. The upper compartment is where we have translation or sliding. So that whole ball and socket can slide forward and back, side to side. Those are the ones where we see problems related to the jaw. So there is a facial sling that's associated with the jaw and the jaw capsule. But we also have the disc. And that disc is connected to that facial sling through the joint capsule. As we look at it, we have two muscles. We have the lateral pterygoid and the superior, or the lower head and the superior head of the lateral pterygoid. The inferior head attaches primarily to the neck of the condyle, and the superior head connects to the disc. When we open our mouth, or even more so when we bite, the lateral pterygoid can pull the disc forward. So if when we bite unilaterally, a space opens up, it can pull the disc to keep it in intimate contact. These are very functional things that are happening all the time, but we don't think about them. So this lateral pterygoid muscle can also do movements of the jaw. So it pulls the jaw forward, so it goes into protraction. It moves the disc, which isn't always together with the, with the lower portion. We also, and some of these are pictures again coming from the face, uh, and they're just one of a whole series of slices. But we can get the styloid process and the stylomandibular ligaments. Very often, on, oops, very often on panoramics, we'll see a calcified stylohyoid ligament or a stylomandibular ligament. When it gets calcified all the way, it leads to Ernst syndrome or Eagle syndrome, and it's a problem. We'll sometimes see that on panoramics, but it especially becomes apparent sometimes when we're going through cone beam x-rays. And we'll see calcifications all the way. And sometimes we'll even see a calcification and then you can actually see where it is fractured. Now, one of the problems with everything we do with joints is we forget that the joints don't work independently. So instead, think of your jaw as being a three-legged stool. One leg, is the right joint, the other one is the left joint, and the third leg is the teeth. If you sit on a three-legged stool, it's very stable. You can put a little child or a big man, if all three legs are the same length. If, on the other hand, you have a stool with three legs that aren't the same length, or only one is different, when you sit on it, it's gonna rack. If you sit on it for a few minutes, the rack is not a big deal. If you have to sit on that three-legged stool with legs of different lengths for a long time, like you're sitting at a bar and it's a bar stool, it's gonna drive you crazy. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna twist your body, you're gonna put a hip on the floor and an arm on top of the bar to stabilize it. If it's not stable, we stabilize it using our muscles, all of the muscles of our body. And this is an important concept because that's what happens when we have an unstable jaw position. We must stabilize it. And stabilization is not one muscle or two muscles. It's a whole host of muscles. As each one changes, another one changes to compensate. Compensation is good. Muscles compensate. We know this. It's exceptional. If they didn't, we'd be in big trouble. If they compensate too much for too long, they shorten, they produce trigger points, they get repetitive strain injuries. So when we're talking about the anatomy and physiology, we have to think about things like repetitive strain injury and muscle overuse syndromes. So now let's talk about the muscles. So we have four primary muscles we all think about. The temporalis muscle, the masseter, the medial pterygoid, and the lateral pterygoid. We've talked about the lateral pterygoid a little bit. We use it for protracting the mandible, but the lateral pterygoid is also important because when somebody's in a closed lock, if they start to open and the lateral pterygoids contract to open, but the disc is blocking movement of the condyle. 
the jaw will then deviate to the side of the lock because the opposite lateral pterygoid will move the condyle forward. So we'll see our chin move toward the side of the lock. The mass that are in the temporalis muscles tend to work as a pair. They're power muscles, but the masseter is more of a power muscle. We use them for chewing, for eating, for lots of different things. But we often forget that the medial pterygoid is also a flexor of the mandible. So it takes the two condyles and pulls them together. We know that, as I said before, from having done subperiosteal implants. The temporalis muscle, on the other hand, is not a power muscle. It's an aiming muscle. So as we start to close our mouth together, it makes lots of adjustments. And the adjustments that get made by the temporalis are easy to see because it's, you can see it by the angle of the fibers in the muscle. So as we look at the pictures, we'll take a better look at that. However, the buccinator muscle is also very important in eating and chewing, as are all the superhyoid and infrahyoid muscles. You can't eat if you don't open and close. So the medial pterygoid muscle connects to the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone, and it works with the masseter. So we've got to keep in mind when it's doing that, it's also flexing the mandible inward. So elevating, closing the jaw, that's going to be done by the masseter, the medial pterygoid, and the temporalis, protraction by the lateral pterygoid, retraction by a combination of the anterior digastric, the superhyoids, the infrahyoids, the posterior digastric, which is not a trigeminal innervated nerve, but rather a cervical nerve. So. The masseter muscle, we all know it comes from the zygomatic arch to the mandibular ramus. Its function is to close the jaw. As you will see, the fibers come forward and up. So it's not a straight up motion of the jaw, but it's actually an up and forward motion of the jaw that it does. Now in this picture, you can see we have the parotid gland. Again, I want you to remember every single step of the way, we have lots of muscles layered upon each other. Again, this one is from the face and it shows you the pictures of the muscles, but not in the usual way we're looking at them, but rather we're looking at them where we have the masseter muscle here. We have the medial pterygoid muscle here. So I want you to start to think about where these muscles are when you're looking at your cone beams. I know they're not designed for looking at muscles, but we know where everything is based on this. So all these muscles are connected by fascia. But the fascia, much like that chicken, you can't tell one muscle for another completely in function. So even though you may have contraction in one, you've got movements in others that are going along with it. Again, we can look at things from a different view now, if we cut the face frontally, you get a view of the nose, but you also get a view. Here's the parotid gland, here's the masseter, here's the buccinator muscle. As we're coming across, we see all these different things in a different viewpoint. This is crazy important. Up here is the temporalis connecting to the temporal tendon. When we talk about temporal tendonitis, we're talking about the pain connected to the fascial tissue again not muscle. I think I've shown you this picture already. So let's talk about the muscles of mastication. If we talk about the temporalis muscle, it's a positioning muscle. It can be used for clenching, but it's a fine tuning muscle. It's got a much smaller number of fibers per nerve than the masseter does, which is a power muscle. So these muscles here, tend to pull the mandible back, but it pulls it back through the coronoid tendon. Up here, we're closing up, but we're also tending to fine tune right to left to adjust. So if we hit first on one side or the other, the temporalis muscle is gonna kind of ease us into position. We have to remember this muscle does not work by itself. We have the facial muscles as well, 
the coronoid process occasionally, which we should we'll remember we can get an enlarged or hyperplasia of the coronoid process, and it can actually cause a physical impairment. Again, this is a book from a picture from the face. These pictures did not copy well. I think I need to get a professional copy person, but we get to see how all these different muscles layer over one another. So this is the superior auricularis that actually works to pull the air up. And then there's fascia. So these layers of fascia connect one over the other. Now this picture is straight out of Travel, And this is how we kind of look at things more often. So we have the temporal parietal muscle. We have the occipitalis and frontalis muscle, the orbicularis oculi. And it's like, ah, this is great, except all these different muscles get stuck together. So over the skull, we've got a layer of fascia, then a layer of muscle, then a layer of fascia. Why does that matter? Well, Travell very well lined out for us patterns of referred pain and trigger points. And the X is where a trigger point would be. And the red is where we'd feel referred pain. So this trigger point in the occipitalis muscle can cause pain across the head to the eye, can also cause it to the forehead. Important thing for us to remember about trigger points is they spread like crystals on a window. So if you're driving your car in the wintertime and you put your windshield washer on and the windshield washer sweeps up and back a couple times, if the water is too cold and the air is too cold, all of a sudden you'll start to get a few crystals of ice and in just a second it'll cover the entire windshield because each ice crystal will spread and cause more crystals to form. Same thing with trigger points. If two trigger points hurt to the same spot, you can start with either one and get both. If a trigger point hurts to a spot, you'll get a trigger point in the muscle there. They spread. That spread is very important to us. But there's actually more to think about. So as we think about the anatomy, and this is how we learned it, underneath and through these muscles, so up here, under the fascia that covers the skull and under the occipitalis muscles, we got the occipital nerve. Down here is the greater occipital nerve and then we have the greater and lesser occipital nerve up here. These nerves pass through several muscles. If these muscles are tight, it causes trauma or pressure on the nerve. So the most common type of pressure on the nerve we think about is if you hit your crazy bone and you get a sudden jerk, you'll feel the sharp pain and it'll shoot all the way down your arm. Wow, it's awful stuff. Or you fall asleep on the couch and you sleep for a few hours and your whole arm is numb and your fingers are numb and your hand is numb. Those are both nerve injuries. One's acute and one is chronic. Well, when we have tight occipital muscles, these get pinched. When we have tight trapezius muscles, these get pinched. When we have tight semispinalis muscles, these get pinched. They can get pinched all the way down. I'm not sure how many of you do trigger point injections. I was lucky enough to study some with Dr. Travell. And one of the worst muscles we always get is we get the splenus capitis muscle, which they show over here cut off. It comes down and over. If we go to the other side where the splenus capitis would be, underneath the spot where the trigger points are, there's kind of a space. And down there buried in that space is something called the vertebral artery. I love doing trigger point injections and prolotherapy, and I want all of you to learn these things, but it's crazy important to remember that underneath all this structure sometimes is very important things. So nowadays we have physical therapists who are dry needling people right, left, and in between. I recently had a patient who came in who was being dry needled by the physical therapist, a recent graduate, and she explained to me how she woke up and the whole, she, she kind of passed out I think in the process, but when she got up, her whole back and neck and back of her head and the whole table was covered in blood. Well, the vertebral artery is one of the two main sources of blood to the brain. And even a small needle hitting it can cause a bleed. If you inject in it, you can cause a stroke. We need to remember the anatomy. And it's like, sometimes we don't think about it. 
But underneath this, there can be important structures like the occipital nerve, the vertebral arteries. So I want you to always be aware if you're gonna go in someplace you don't know before you do, study the anatomy. Again, going back to Travel, we all know that you can get referred pain. The most common type of referred pain is somebody's having a heart attack, but they feel pain in their shoulder or their elbow. Well, it turns out the most common place for somebody having heart pain to feel their first episode is to have head, neck, or jaw, or tooth pain. So we should always put into our differential diagnosis, oh, maybe this person's having a heart attack or, or other problem. But also in our differential diagnosis, as patients walk in, these muscles can hurt directly into the teeth and the sinuses. They can cause headaches. If you have a person coming in and say, oh, I've got a terrible pain in my upper tooth, and you take x-rays and it looks normal, or you freeze it and then the pain moves to the lower tooth. You have to stop and think. I see people all the time who've had one tooth extracted and then another tooth extracted, then another tooth extracted. And what they had was referred pain. Typically the pain that's referred from muscles is dull, achy type of pain. If you're having dull, achy pain, assume that maybe you have pain coming from the muscles. If you have headache pain, Assume that maybe you have pain coming from the muscles. Now, if you go back to that idea of having a three-legged stool, now the muscles, if, if the bite's not right or one of the joints is out of whack, the muscles have to balance the stool. So if you cut the occlusion off on one side of the mouth, when people close, they'll hit on one side, but on the other side, they don't have a solid landing. So the masseter, the temporalis, and the medial pterygoid on that side will tend to tighten up. So on the side with short occlusion, a lot of times the muscles will be tighter and have more trigger points. This picture on the top here is very important because we've all been looking at these pictures forever, but what we sometimes forget is these pictures are not pictures of a single patient. These pictures are what are called frequency diagrams. So Janet Travell looked at thousands of patients, and then they looked at the trigger points, and then they looked at where the referred pain was. And in the middle here, that was the most common area for these trigger points to cause pain. So these trigger points would cause pain here, and these trigger points would cause pain here. However, the less speckled, the less more speckled areas like this may be a standard deviation out. And the really light speckle might be another standard deviation out. But for some patients, they may hurt from the tip of their toe or the tip of their nose or to their tailbone. And we like to call those our crazy patients, but they're not crazy. They just don't have the normal standard of referral patterns we're used to looking at. So as we look at these muscles, I want you to remember this, but these muscles overlie the, the parietal muscles, the occipital frontal muscles, frontalis muscles. So I love this. This was the very first animation cell I owned. And I bought it, my wife bought it for me, my late wife Elise bought it for me because we were looking at a store. And this is the story of my life. How can you have a toothache when you haven't any teeth? We have people who have toothaches that they don't have teeth or they have toothache in the teeth, and then what do we do? We do things to the teeth, but it doesn't mean the pain is coming from the teeth. So let's look at the rest of the body. When we talk about the body and the function, and we talk about suprahyoid and infrahyoid muscles, if supra and infrahyoid muscles contract, they will tend to pull the jaw downward. If we're biting at the same time it happens, or even if we're not, that'll have a tendency to displace our whole head forward. As our head displaces forward, we tend to tip our head in. If it's doing it all the time, we'll tip our head in and then rotate our head out. Now, if I look at from the side, that would be our head tips in and then it rotates out. And that will tighten all the posterior cervical muscles. Now, if you remember, these are the same muscles that the greater occipital nerve would pass through. If we move a little farther down, 
we see all the little muscles that move our head and different ones cause slightly different movements, but everyone is capable of having trigger points. So the splenus capitis muscle, the splenus cervicus muscle, again, if you look at the splenus capitis muscle and you go over here, you think, oh, there's nothing there. Always remember there may be a vertebral artery buried underneath. So now we look at other, other functions. So the medial pterygoid muscle connects to the medial wall of the lateral pterygoid plate. It inserts on the inside of the mandible. Where if you look at the direction of fibers, they're going upward, but they're also going mesial. That's why it flexes the mandible. It's very hard to find that in anatomy texts. I've had arguments with people who are quote unquote orofacial pain specialists who read the book and they say, well, I don't see anywhere it says it flexes the mandible. Simple physics say, if these muscles contract, they're gonna pull the mandible, which is very flexible toward the midline. I want you to always keep that in mind. The lateral pterygoid muscles. So if they contract this way together, they will cause protrusion if it's both sides. If only one side can pull and the other one can't, like when you have a displaced disc, the one that can pull forward will come forward, the other one won't, and the jaw will tend to move to the side of the closed lock. This is how we understand what side is locked, where the lock is. The superior head will connect to the disc but it doesn't just connect to the disc. A good portion of the superior head will also connect downward into the condyle. So again, each one of these muscles, we have to remember has a function and it's an ideal function and then it has a function in less than an ideal spot. So we can open the mouth, but gravity by itself opens our mouth. If you remember when we used to have boring lectures in dental school, you'd hear people's jaws dropping and heads falling and you'd see the head bob as we suddenly woke up. So there's a difference between passive opening and active opening from the muscles. When we open with the anterior digastric muscle, the only way it works is if the infrahyoid muscles are working with it. Elevate with the, with the elevators are the ones we're always used to for traction with the pterygoid muscle. So just a quick hint, and I'll talk more about this in a later lecture. If you have somebody who has a closed lock, these muscles tighten up because of the pain and it becomes almost impossible to get them unlocked. It is possible to use reflexes to relax all of the mandibular elevators instantly. We're gonna talk about those reflexes, but not in this lecture. So lateral pterygoid, we've talked about quite a bit, but think about it also as fine tuning lateral movements of the jaw and also pulling that disc forward. So if we bite on the back teeth on this side, especially if we bite on something hard, we turn that into a fulcrum. This is the short level of the fulcrum and the whole jaw going on the other side is the long level. So as those muscles contract, it will have a tendency to move this condyle downward. That's important. That's the whole concept of pivotal appliances. Uh, just remember if you're doing pivotal appliances, unilateral pivotals work without an outside force. Bilateral pivotals do not. Again, if we look at the medial pterygoid, and this is why I want you to encourage never to think two-dimensional about anything again always look three-dimensional and when you're looking at your cone beam x-rays, think about where the muscles are. This is the medial pterygoid. I want to point and you can't see because I'm used to lecturing in front of people. It's very challenging lecturing when you can't see what I point to because I'm a pointer. Uh, so this medial pterygoid muscle, the pull is medial. There is vertical pull, but there is a lot of medial pull. And if you pull on both sides of the jaw simultaneously, it will flex. So now again, if you start to look at cone beams and look at x-rays, so that lateral pterygoid plate is here. The muscle is going to connect up to the condyle. The masseter is out here. Medial pterygoid is here. 
Where is it pulling? It's pulling upward and medially. There are vectors of force. You always have to balance the vectors. So it can, when we look at a kinesiographic tracing and we look at a four or five, we look at up and down vectors of movement, forward and back vectors of movement and lateral, and then we combine them into three dimensional representations. The same thing happens with the muscles. And now when you look at our neuromuscular scans, you have to understand that everything we see on the screen is about what's happening at the chip, tip of the chin. But it's the result. We infer what's happening everywhere along the jawbone. We have the sphenoid sinus, the zygomatic arch. So we know that the masseter is going to connect to the zygomatic arch, but the temporalis is going to come up under it through the coronoid tendon. The buccinator, super important because it keeps our food in the right spot. So, now, if we look at the anterior digastric and the infrahyoid muscles, we move down a little bit. So we went from the head to the jaw. From the head to the jaw is that three-legged stool, the right joint, the left joint, and the teeth. If all three of them are the same length, we have natural built-in stability. If they're not the same, we have muscles that compensate. As we move to the next layer down, we get to the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone is the only bone in the entire body that doesn't connect to another bone. It connects upward to the tongue and to the mandible and to the posterior cervical areas. Underneath, you have the infrahyoid muscles that are pulling down. Stabilization is a, is a combination of muscles from the head to the jaw, the jaw to the hyoid bone and the hyoid bone down, and counterbalanced by all the posterior cervical muscles. We're going back to the, to the Travel book again. And again, we see we have muscles that come from the head to the jaw, which aren't represented in this picture. We have another layer of muscles that come from the mandible down to the hyoid bone and from the hyoid bone down. One of them over here, the oval hyoid muscle, not really important for many, whoops, not really important for many things except if somebody has chronic hiccups. Sometimes you can do a trigger point in the oval hyoid and get rid of a chronic hiccups. Um, other than that, it's just another one of those muscles. Splenus capitis, that's the one that that's the one that underneath it, if you do a trigger point, you can accidentally hit the vertebral artery. The levator scapula, crazy important if people are working with their keyboards too high, their chairs too low. People like hairdressers, they shrug their shoulders up, they're always up and they affect the head position. But if you affect the head position and the upper neck position, you affect the jaw position. So the position of the head and the jaw and the jaw and the hyoid and the hyoid to the rest of the body are all connected. You can't just cut the head off at about the level of C5. And what you'll see is all these muscles back here, plus the sternocleidomastoid muscles, are all the posterior muscles for support. They hold our head upright. Sternocleidomastoids specifically get hurt a lot if you get a whiplash accident. Up in the front, we have the prevertebral muscles and the super and infrahyoid muscles. These are crazy important for balance. When we start talking about doing trigger points, they can go quite deep sometimes. I would never go that deep. Another thing when we talk about the joint, we've been looking at all these joints in cross section. This is a better, I've got better, whoops. I got better at taking pictures from that book I was talking about, but you can see the reflections. If you think about from the frontal view, your jaws are in a very different position. And now you have a medial connection of the disc and a lateral connection of the disc. And remember, if we have a problem, the problem with disc is usually at the lateral pole of the, of the condyle. And if a disc displaces, it displaces medially and anteriorly. So in towards you from this picture, but also medially. 
Now, if that medial pterygoid is pulling this head of the condyle inward, it's going to be pressing on that retrodiscal lamina or on the disc. Again, all the muscles, we kind of think of them layer by layer. It's, it's hard. I still have a hard time doing it. But as I keep going through this book over and over again, I'm starting to think three-dimensionally for the muscles in much the same way I do for the CT scan. The CT scans have actually forced me to change what I do. So we talk about airway all the time in dentistry, and we talk about sleep apnea and airway, and the scalene muscles are crazy important to airway. So if we breathe correctly, this, whoops, this bottom picture, 80% of our breathing, whoops, 80% of our breathing is coming from our diaphragm. and 20% comes from our chest. What's called paradoxical breathing, I like to call it ass backward breathing, is almost all the breathing comes from the chest and the diaphragm or the belly muscle actually goes backwards when we breathe in. This is a problem. Most of our patients are females and a lot of them have had children. When they're nine months pregnant before the baby drops, diaphragm breathing becomes almost impossible. They can't breathe with their belly down here. So they end up doing all their breathing with their chest, their intercostal muscles, and especially the scalenes. The problem is when the baby drops, they don't go back to normal breathing. Now we have a patient who has a problem all the time with their breathing. If they happen to be an opera singer or they play the trumpet, they'll go back to normal breathing. Some of the yoga people can go back to normal breathing, but how they breathe affects what happens. So these are the scalene muscles. These scalene muscles connect and what they actually do is they lift the rib cage up when you breathe, but they're only supposed to do a little bit of the work. The intercostal muscles will pull the rib cage together, also tending to lift the rib cage. What's important here is the nerves that exit from between the vertebrae pass between the anterior and medial heads of the scalenes, and they also pass underneath the pectoralis minor muscles. If these nerves are pinched between tight muscles, we can get pain, numbness, tingling, weakness, and in patients who have forward shoulders, those same muscles, nerves can get pinched lower down. So we know these patients, we see these pastures that can also pinch on blood vessels. Sorry, I didn't correct this picture. I am not good at doing uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations and I missed this one. Um, the trigger points are marked in the scalenes and then the red, just like the other one, are frequency diagrams, but it can give you pain into the back, up the neck, even though it's not marked here, into the chest. It can make it feel like you can't breathe, especially since these are accessory breathing muscles. Um, and it, it tends to be a lot involved with things like anxiety. So it also affects other parts of the body. So I'm gonna kind of talk to you. We've all done the stuff where we put cotton rolls in between people's teeth, and then we show them their arms are strong with them in and weak with them out. Well, the whole body's connected. And it's kind of annoying because we're dentists and we're not supposed to have to worry about what happens down low, but I'm gonna kind of walk you through what I walk my patients through. And any of you who heard Norman Thomas talk, you sort of understand it. So I have all my patients stand. We all know we're supposed to look at pronated or supinated feet, but what we also know, if somebody has a long leg, short leg, they'll have a tendency to hold their long leg off to the side. Now, when they do that, it's actually a muscle compensation. We have to remember that muscles will always compensate to protect the whole. So in this person, when they do this, it levels off their hip. The problem with muscle compensation is it sometimes causes long-term problems somebody someplace else. So this patient, if they walk around like this for 20 years, chances are without a specific trauma, it's this hip, this knee, and or this ankle that'll get replaced and have surgery or arthritis. So when we examine our patients, first thing we do is we have them stand with their feet together. When we have them stand with their feet together, now we can actually see the tip and the hip. 
Now, well, you think it's amazing, and the patients are always amazed when we put cotton rolls between their teeth and increase their strength. It's even more so when we put a book under their foot to level off their hips, and then we check their arm strength, and then we take it away and they get weak. So a couple things we need to talk about, and I always tell my patients to cheat. So the cheat here is we take them from their compensation, we take away their compensation, then we balance them. And then when we take away the balance, we don't give them back their compensation. But what we get to see from this is the, what, what Sherrington called ascending and descending disorders. So if we have an ascending disorder, it means we have a short leg and a long leg or a small hip and a large hip, but we have a disbalance or unbalance starting from the feet going up. If on the other hand, it starts with a jaw problem or a small airway problem, which is much more likely, then we have a descending problem from the head going down. Now the thoracolumbar spine, I like to think of it like a slinky. If you took a slinky and you spread it out when you were in high school physics and then you made a wave go up and down the slinky, that wave would go up and down through the whole thing. That's the same thing that happens to the thoracolumbar spine, is the muscles up and down the whole spine will automatically adjust. The same thing happens if you're sitting or if you're standing. So very often patients will cross their legs if they're sitting. And if you uncross them, they'll be hipped. And you can balance them off with that book. And it'll affect all the way up. Of course, whoops, you can balance them correctly or you can balance them incorrectly. So in this case, we have a patient with a curve. And if you take the low buttocks and you raise it, you straighten it out. And if you put it on the other side, you mess it up. So everything is based on time. Some of us work with atlas orthogonal or nuclear chiropractors who love to look at the body in a supine or on their stomach or in a prone position on a table and will measure the leg lengths in this position. The problem is we then put them into gravity. And when we put them to gravity, they change. So the changes we see are in the thoracolumbar muscles. If there's curvatures, on the inside of the curvature of the spine, the muscles are tight. So on the tight side, we're gonna be more likely to get muscle pain, dull, achy pain. So in this case, it would be dull, achy pain, whoops, here, here, and here. But we have to remember these things are floating all the time and they can also have rotations. Whoops. Again, same thing with the curvature in the muscles and they go all the way from the head all the way down to the tailbone. The inside of the curve is where we get the dull, achy pain. The outside of the curve on the other side is where we get sharp shooting pains. So I'm gonna back this up a little bit now because I'm gonna talk about this picture. This is the one we work at all the time. And this is the picture where I usually use when I'm telling people about a diagnosis and how what happens with their jaw and their neck and their back and their feet relate. So if we put two cotton rolls in somebody's mouth here or a pencil across the teeth and we balance them out and we check their arm strength, they're gonna be strong. And then we take it away and they're weak. And then we say, see, this means you need to have your bite built up. I kind of describe it differently to my patients though. First thing I tell them is everything we do has a cheat. So the cheat to that is when we put the cotton rolls between their teeth, we haven't really made them right. We've made them less wrong. As we've made them less wrong, they can function well. Had we not made them less wrong and just had them bite on their teeth, they would have been strong. But first we made them less wrong and then we took away the cotton and we made them go into a bite that was more wrong and they instantly got weak. So the weakness is going from a healthier position to a less healthy position. And the brain hates that change. So the way I talk to my patients about it is this picture up on the upper right. I ask them if they've ever been on a 
doctor scale. And when they get on the doctor scale, the first thing you do is you set the 50 pound, and then you set the 10 pound, and then you set the one pound, and you wiggle it ever so slightly till you get it perfectly balanced. Here's the problem. If you move that one pound just a little bit, the scale doesn't go a little bit out of balance. It basically goes clunk. If you move it a little bit the other way, it goes clunk again going up. So I tell my patient, I've got a diagnosis for you. You've been clunked. You're out of balance. But this lack of balance affects the entire body. And this is crazy important. All these posterior muscles here and these anterior muscles here are balanced against each other. So all the muscles of the posterior portion of the neck, I keep pointing at it, but you can't see my finger, but all the muscles at the posterior portion of the neck are compensating for the small changes here. So again, the hyoid bone is the center of everything and it affects us. So a lot of times, instead of using cotton rolls, I'll use an aqualizer in their mouth and then show them the same thing. It works a little better because an aqualizer is always perfectly balanced. But the real reason I use the aqualizer is because it lets us affect other things. So we come back to the historical lumbar area and now I put an aqualizer in my patient's mouth. Depending on the office I'm in, I either just have them walk around with it, or if I'm in my Highland Park office, I have them go up and down a flight of steps. When they go up and down a flight of steps with the aqualizer in their mouth, which is constantly changing its balance, when they come back down, I check their height. Now, instead of putting a book under, I just check. And we, ha we have the ability to differentiate an ascending patient from a descending patient based on their response to the aqualizer. So if I put an aqualizer in somebody's mouth and now when they stand together, their hips are at the same height, what it means is we've changed the curves up and down through the whole thoracic spine, whether they're sitting or standing. Now, Sometimes we have very difficult patients. So if you have a patient who has a long leg on one side when they stand and a, long, and a short hip on the other when they sit and you try to rebuild their mouth, it's got two bites. A lot of us talk about these two bited position patients. Sometimes it has to do with how the head sits on the shoulder. So I want you just to always think about the whole body with everything we do. I'm working on a physical a project with several physical therapists right now using the aqualizer to show that we can change the curves in the thoracolumbar lumbar spine, but to make it easy, we're doing it based on measurements of hip height. We're just trying to do a very simple proof of fact. As we know, there's a lot of opposition to neuromuscular dentistry and permanent changes. However, if you only look at the teeth, you're only looking at one small part of the picture. If you look at the whole body, that may actually be the justification for the permanent changes. But I don't want this to come from dentists, so I'm doing the study with physical therapists. And what they're seeing is almost every patient, not all, you're seeing the hip heights correct. What that means is these people don't have ascending problems, they have descending problems. And if you don't correct the underlying issues in the jaw and the head, you're not going to have any long-term permanence to correction in the lower body. So sitting, sitting on a book, people sitting on a wallet. You have people who sit on a wallet for 100 years and they never have any pain. Whoops. That would be the person in the middle. They sit on the wallet and it straightens out their spine. The person in the, at the right-hand side, if he sits on a wallet, it increases the scoliosis in the back and he ends up with terrible pain. And then his right leg starts to get sh shooting sciatica pain from pinched nerves. So we can compensate all the time. The compensation is through all the spine and the muscles. And we get pain on the short side of the muscles. Now we move down to where the head connects to the spine. The head connects to the spine to the upper cervical component. There are several muscles in the upper cervical component. 
each one can cause referred pain. Again, the dark red is the most common place, not the most severe pain. The darkly speckled is second most common, lightly speckled is next most common, but all of them are possible. And there are lots and lots of muscles. Every little movement we make at our head has different muscles. We've seen this picture before. There's the vertebral artery, but we have the cut semispinalis and the trapezius cut. So it's, we can see all these muscles and they all are tight in patients who have forward head posture. If a patient has forward head posture, they also have to tip their head up to level their plane of sight. So the atlas and the axis, the atlas is the first vertebrae and it's called the atlas from Greek mythology. And then the axis is the second, C1 and C2. So rotation of the heads at C2 and rocking and tilting of the head forward and back is at C1. So there's a mathematician, I got a typo here, I'm going to be corrected the next time I give this lecture, the quadrant theorem of Gouzet, combining rotation and translation. He determined that the center of rotation of the mandible was not on the condylar axis between the condyles, but actually on the dens of C2, or the axis. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a minute. Dr. Freund, an Atlas Orthogonal Chiropractor I work with, gave me this, and it's a very nice version of the head and the first degree vertebrae. And it's on elastic, so I can pull it down. So the atlas is that first vertebrae. The second vertebrae is the axis. This would be the dens. And the dens sits in the middle of the axis. And if you look from this view, it actually comes right up almost through foramen magnum. If this is out of whack, it can give us all kinds of problems. And so nuca chiropractors and atlas orthogonal chiropractors are very good at adjusting very minute adjustments here. So in the body, we have three fixed points. One fixed point is our teeth when we close. It's one leg of that three-legged stool and it's pretty solid. A second fixed point is when we sit and a third one is when we stand. The atlas and orthogonal or atlas axis is where the last part comes from. So I'm gonna go back to my quadrant theorem of Gouzet. So mathematically, they looked at a combination of the rotation and the translation. And what they found was the middle of rotation or the axis of rotation was in the middle of the atlas or C1 on the dens of C2. Okay, so I, I'm gonna leave the blood vessels a little bit. I'm gonna fly through them very quick. Uh, branches of the maxillary artery. Thing I want you to remember, blood flow to the anterior two thirds of the brain is controlled by the trigeminal nerve, both the sympathetic, parasympathetic, and somatosensory nerves all travel to the meninges of the brain. 100% of headaches and migraines are related to the trigeminal nerve except for the occasional brain bleed. So it's like if we have a headache, we have a trigeminal or a trigeminal vascular or a trigeminal cervical complex headache. So these are gonna be important but I think most important is the posture, the fascia, the muscles. The blood vessels go all over the place. One of the things we're looking at is the superficial temporal artery. And then we have to remember it's possible to get something called temporal arteritis. It's marked by a set rate. It's important because if you miss it, it can lead to blindness. The branches of the maxillary artery right now, I'm going to kind of go and say that the primary maxillary artery passes through the tergopalatine fossa, the same area where the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve comes out of the skull, and where the tergopalatine ganglion or sphenopalatine ganglion is located. Venous drainage. If we don't get good venous drainage, we get backup of fluid. The same is true of lymphatic drainage. If we have dark circles under the eyes, you'll notice all the arteries and were marked in red and the veins are marked in blue or cyan. 
if you're cyanotic, you're dying. You're turning blue all over. If you have dark circles under your eyes, you have blood that doesn't have enough oxygen and it's there for us to see. The nerves, three, but we have to remember we have the motor nerves of the trigeminal nerve are all coming through the foramenal valley and the mandibular branch. It's gonna go to not just the jaw muscles, but to the mylohyoid in the floor of the mouth and the anterior digastric. It also goes to the tensor tympani. The tensor tympani is part embryologically of the medial pterygoid muscle. If the medial pterygoid muscle is in spasm, so is the tensor of the tympanic membrane. The tensor of the belly palatini that opens and closes the eustachian tube also closes up the roof of our mouth. Sensory branches, the auricular temporal art, art nerve. We need to know how to block it if we're gonna work with very painful joints. Sometimes blocking it allows us to manipulate things. The rest of these, we know the chordae tympani, as you all remember, is a facial nerve that gives us tapes to the anterior two thirds of the tongue. These nerves, just like the muscles, are connected. They have all these linkages that are important. So the branches of the trigeminal nerve is, we have the ophthalmic, the maxillary, the mandibular, and we can kind of follow them all out. We don't need them right now, which is gonna be another lecture. Again, the tergopalatine fossa. So we have a three-walled structure, which is the tergopalatine fossa, and then we have an opening at the tergopalatine fissure. That tergopalatine fissure is where we can do a suprazygomatic injection. So we come from above the zygomatic arch, come down, and it's easier to get in there than it is to do a mandibular block. Much easier and can give you life-changing results. There's also a sphenopalatine foramen, which you can come in through the nose. It's way over my pay grade, but we can also use a cotton tip catheter and apply anesthetic through those very thin tissues with no needle. So we're gonna just kind of move on and save the rest of this for the next lecture. The questions are always gonna be good. Um, and the next lecture will probably be on the sphenopalatine ganglion. Again, I want to apologize. Again, this is where the chordae tympani joins the lingual nerve together to get us that taste function. I want to apologize. I'm not used to talking on talking to computer screens. I forget to look at the camera. I'm always looking at the picture, but we know this anatomy, but we have to rethink it. So I want you to really think about learning the anatomy inside and out. It's so important. The nerves, the blood vessels, and I don't care if you can name them. I just want you to be able to look at a patient, look at a CAT scan, know what everything is and know how they balance. If they're not balanced, we're gonna get clunked. If our patients are clunked, they have pain. If we have problems with bites, sometimes it's not the articulation from the lower jaw to the head, but it's the articulation from the head to the rest of the body. It's a two-way street. What happens at the mouth can affect the body all the way down to the toes, and what happens down to the toes can affect the body all the way up to the mouth. That's why I show my patients that I can put a book under their foot to level their hips and make their arm strength better. I can put cotton rolls between their teeth and help their balance. But then I show them I can put an aqualizer in their mouth, something that temporarily will balance the upper and lower jaw against each other and having them go up and down steps, I can change the curves in their back and change their hip heights and sometimes make a long leg, short leg, even out. So the whole body connects. And this is why the anatomy is important, the posture is important, and the fascia that connects it all. We're not gonna talk about fascial skeletons in this course, but there basically is a fascial skeleton that goes through the whole body much like the osseous skeleton. So thank you for tonight. I am gonna be posting separately a video that I did with five physical therapists. Four of them were live, and the fifth one came in on Zoom a little bit later. So the video is gonna start late, but 
it's me doing the same explanation of pasture and how the whole body connects to physical therapists. Because a lot of times the physical therapists who we count on don't always understand how the whole body works together. So it's really important that we teach them. So thank you very much and have a good night.